All right, good afternoon. Um, just first of all, I want to welcome uh, some new faces in the briefing. Uh, we have a group of youth champions who are in the back. Uh, they are here at headquarters as part of the UN's Office on Disarmament Affairs Youth Champions for Disarmament Training Program. So welcome and train well and stay youthful. Um, <laughs> Oh, yes, good luck to you. Yes, good. <laughs> Speaking from the other side, good luck. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, let's move on to our serious uh, business. Um, our humanitarian colleagues in Ukraine are telling us that the situation in the eastern and northeastern part of Ukraine remains volatile, where reports from UN teams and open sources of heavy fighting, including in and around Mariupol, Chuviv, Kharkiv, Izum, uh, Chernihiv, Sumy, and Severodonetsk. In northern Ukraine, uh, open sources and UN teams are also reporting increasingly violent clashes on the outskirts of Kiev, including in Bucha, Hostomel, and Irpin, and that civilians who are trapped in some of those uh, areas lack access to supplies and basic services. We welcome public communications uh, by the two sides regarding their intentions to facilitate safe passage for civilians out of conflict areas, including Mariupol, Kharkiv, and Sumy. Our humanitarian colleagues stress it is critical that civilians, whether they choose to stay or to choose to leave, are protected. And if they leave, it is in direction of their choosing. The UN Refugee Agency today said that more than 2 million Ukrainians have now crossed international borders out of Ukraine. According to the UN's Human Rights Office, between the 24th of February and the 7th of March, at the end of the day, 1,335 civilian casualties were recorded, which includes 474 people killed. As mentioned earlier, the office notes it is difficult to verify the actual number of deaths and injuries. Humanitarian organizations are scaling up response to impacted people in the east and the west of the country, as security allows. In the east, the International Committee for the Red Cross has provided more than 200,000 medical items to mobile clinics. Uh, the NGO Médecins Sans Frontières has also delivered about 120 cubic meters of medical supplies to uh, Ukraine. In the West, focus is primarily on supporting internally displaced people. UNHCR is providing thermal blankets and mattresses for 6,000 people, complementing an earlier delivery of 18,500 high thermal blankets by the International Organization for Migration to support displaced people in Lviv. A common humanitarian operations coordination center has now been established in, um, in eastern Poland, which will serve as a common uh, space for all humanitarian organizations responding to the unfolding crisis in Ukraine and neighboring country. Uh, it's being established in Resoval in Poland. And an update from neighboring Moldova, where the UN team there um, is ha helping handle 250,000 refugees who have crossed the border in less than two weeks. More than 100,000 uh, remain in Moldova, and the UN Refugee Agency is helping local authorities assist uh, these men, women, and children. Nearly 70 percent of those refugees, however, are women and girls, and nearly half of them are children. Uh, just to remind you that yesterday afternoon, uh, the Security Council held a meeting on Ukraine. Briefing Council members were the Emergency Relief uh, Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, um, and the new head of the UN Children's Fund, Catherine Russell. Uh, Mr. Griffiths noted that we already had enough on our, uh, excuse me, noted that we already had enough on our hands with many other unnecessary and unwanted conflicts leaving misery in their wake. We had no need for a further war, he stressed. Meanwhile, Ms. Uh, Russell um, said that she had just returned from the Romanian-Ukrainian border, where she met with mothers and children who had to flee their homes at a moment's notice. She said that UNICEF and its partners are working 24 hours a day to meet rapidly escalating humanitarian needs in Ukraine and neighboring uh, countries. Uh, those remarks were shared with you. Um, and I've been getting quite a lot of questions uh, following a news report, um, and I just wanted to correct uh, the mistaken impression that UN staff were told to avoid using certain words to describe the situation in Ukraine. 
It's simply not the case that there were some sort of global instructions to all UN staff uh, not to use words like war or invasion to describe the situation. Uh, as proof, I can, you will all have seen the tweet that Rosemary DiCarlo issued uh, yesterday, which said the following, nearly two weeks on, it is painfully clear that those suffering the most after Russia's invasion of Ukraine are civilians killed, wounded, or displaced. This war is senseless. We are ready to support all good faith efforts in negotiating the end to the bloodshed. Uh, similarly, uh, Martin Griffiths, um, uh, the Secretary General have used wide range of words in their statements and remarks to the press uh, to describe what has been going on, and those were all very public for all to see. At the same time, I do want to say there was a, uh, an email that went out to global staff uh, to remind staff that they are international civil servants and uphold the responsibilities that position entails. Um, accordingly, staff were asked to frame any communications in Ukraine as well as any other political matters in a manner that is consistent with the position of the organization and statements of the Secretary General. Uh, this applies not only to the ongoing situation in Ukraine, but other situations around the world. But there were no instructions in that global message uh, to staff uh, not to use certain words. And it's the kind of message that we regularly send out uh, to staff when there is a global event or a national event uh, that has a lot of attention. Uh, UN staff, I think like journalists, are all very passionate, uh, but we all work for an organization and have to uphold um, the, uh, the rules and regulations of the organization in our role as international civil servants. Um, Today, as you all know, is International Women's Day. This morning, the Secretary General took part in a virtual observance for the day. In his video message, he said the pandemic has kept girls and women out of schools and workplaces. They face rising poverty and rising violence. They do the vast majority of the world's unpaid but essential care work, and they're targets of violence and abuse just because of their gender. This year, the theme focuses on women's work on climate change. It reminds us that women bear the brunt of climate change, impact and environmental degradation, said the Secretary General. We need more women environment ministers, business leaders, presidents and prime ministers. They can push countries to address the climate crisis, develop green jobs and build a more just and sustainable world. We cannot emerge from the pandemic with the clock spinning backwards on gender equality. We need to turn the clock forward on women's rights, he said. And uh, peg to International Women's Day, this morning the Executive Director of UN Women, Sima Bahus, spoke to the Security Council on the topic of women, peace and security. She said it is clear that we need another model of leadership on peace and security issues, one that features women's inclusion in economic recovery and is as an essential element in our pursuit of peace. Ms. Bahus emphasized that study after study shows investing in women's economic empowerment yields enormous dividends for both peace and prosperity, and that countries where women are economically marginalized and shut out of the workforce are much more likely to go to war. She added that UN women will work with council members to strengthen this approach. That's okay. I, could, I, I, never, get, I, I never get tired of the sound of my own voice. Don't worry. That's okay. Um, as you saw, uh, to turning to Mali, as you saw, the Secretary General has condemned yesterday's attack perpetrated against a logistics convoy of our colleagues of the UN peacekeeping force in Mali. The attack took place in the region of Mopti in central Mali. Two Egyptian peacekeepers were killed and four others were seriously injured. The injured peacekeepers were transported to a mission hospital in Sivare, where they're currently receiving treatment. The Secretary General reiterated our continued support and solidarity with the people and government of Mali, including through enhancing capacity of the UN mission to protect civilians in the center of Mali, as well as supporting government-led strategy to stabilize that region. The full statement is online. Our colleague, the Deputy Secretary General Mina Mohamed, is in Costa Rica, where she commemorated International Women's Day with girls at the historic Escuela de Señoritas, uh, which I assume means the school for girls, uh, where the fight for women's rights started 99 years ago. Uh, 
She reminded them that women and girls will achieve their dreams and rights by fighting today and tomorrow and engaging boys and men along the way. She also visited an animal sanctuary to see firsthand Costa Rica's leadership in nature-based solutions that protect biodiversity and raise the need to combat illegal animal trade and trafficking. Yesterday, she attended the Sustainable Development Forum in Costa Rica, where she emphasized the importance of leadership by Latin America and the Caribbean to put the world back on track to achieve sustainable development goals. In challenging global environment support with countries trying to recover from the pandemic, the deputy secretary, uh, she also met with the president of Costa Rica, government officials from the region, and resident coordinators on the way to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals and strengthen UN support in this regard. Before departing, she will also chair a meeting with all regional directors of the, in the, of the UN agencies in the region to review joint priorities to support the countries in the region this year. Uh, an update regarding the drought in the Horn of Africa, which we've been talking to you about for quite some time. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that in Ethiopia, some 175,000 people have now been displaced from their homes due to the drought, and more than 1.5 million cows and other livestock are estimated to have died due to food and water. We and our partners are scaling up assistance to people affected by the drought and have reached more than 2.7 million people with food assistance. In February, more than 120 metric tons of medicine and other supplies have been dispatched to the drought-affected areas, and therapeutic food to treat malnourished children is being distributed. Despite support from donors and others, additional funding is urgently needed since needs are expected to further increase. The drought is also severely affecting neighboring Somalia, where 4.5 million people are affected, and 670,000 men, women, and children have been uprooted from their homes. In some of the worst affected areas, water prices have spiked up to 72 percent since November of last year. More than 1.4 million children, which is nearly half of the children under five, are likely to suffer from acute malnutrition due to continuing drought. The Humanitarian Response Plan for Somalia, which seeks nearly $1.5 billion to help 5.5 million of the most vulnerable Somalis, is only 3.3 percent funded. The Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, will virtually brief member states tomorrow on the impact of the drought in the Horn. You can follow that meeting on uh, UN Web TV. And lastly, Tor Veneslan, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, said today he was deeply concerned by the deteriorating security situation in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. This past week, daily violence has claimed the lives of six Palestinians, including one child, and 26 Palestinians, seven Israelis, have been injured. Mr. Veneslan said that every death is tragic and every injury is lamentable, but the loss or injury of a child is particularly devastating. He reiterated that children must never be the target of violence or put in harm's way. In this volatile situation, he said, all concern must refrain from action and provocations that fuel tensions and exercise maximum restraint. There can be no justification for violence or terror, which must be condemned by all. Israeli security forces uh, must use lethal force only when strictly unavoidable to protect life. And he called on political and religious and community leaders to reject violence and speak up against those who try to inflame. The situation. Edith Letter. Thank you very much, Steph. Um, you're making everybody take a Please, when you ask a question, so I okay. can hear you clearly. Thank you. Um, first, uh, two follow up clarifications. Um, on this issue of the report about use, UN staff using right. different words, um, does the email that was sent out uh, mean that or give UN staff the right now to use either the words uh, invasion, war, or both? The the email that went out, and, and I'll be happy to share it with you uh, after the, the briefing, the email that went out to all staff was a reminder that in their social media postings, the messages should be in line with the organization's position, with what the Secretary General is saying. So it's not prescriptive. The Secretary General has used the word war. Rosemary DiCarlo has used the word war. Martin Griffiths has used the word war. So we're, we're saying to people, 
we all understand the anguish that this situation uh, is giving all, all of us, and I'm sure everybody who's, who's watching. You cannot help watching these pictures and not be moved. I mean, we've spoken to uh, colleagues from, the, from humanitarian agencies who are at the border uh, in internal meetings who've broken down because they're just overwhelmed by what they see. And we should express that emotion. We're saying to people, your international civil servants, what you say publicly on social media should be within the framework of what senior leaders say. Okay, um, my, I have one comment that uh, on the statement that was put out about the Secretary General's uh, phone conversation with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, um, it was two sentences. Um, couldn't we get a fuller readout than two very short sentences? I, I, I understand. Uh, I understand your need for more sentences in, uh, for, with just about anything that we put out. Uh, Secretary General is dealing with an ongoing situation. When we're ready to use more sentences, we'll be happy to use more sentences. And my question was about humanitarian corridors. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give us um, an up-to-the-minute or late update on what is happening with opening humanitarian corridors? Sure. So the, we're aware that there are evacuations that are starting in certain, uh, in certain areas. Our colleagues at OCHA are liaising and advocating with the two sides to facilitate safe passage for civilians out of these conflict areas uh, to ensure humanitarian aid can go in. What just needs to be clear is that these corridors were organized bilaterally by the Russians uh, and the Ukrainians. Uh, the ICRC has also been involved. Uh, but for this evacuation that is going on today, the UN is not directly involved in the organizational aspect or the guarantees uh, aspect. Madame. Just to follow up on that, Martin Griffiths was pretty specific yesterday in the kinds of things that he felt were necessary mm -hmm. for uh, a safe passageway, uh, things like a specific route and uh, yeah. contacts on the ground. Has any progress been made since he talked about that yesterday, since the meeting, and, and moving into these uh, uh, that you can tell us about, and, and, and as as we hear of these, um, I mean, yes, in the sense there's been progress in the sense that there is continuing dialogue with the Ukrainian authorities, uh, the colleagues that we've mentioned that are in uh, in Moscow had discussions today that focused on further information sharing and standard operating procedures for the humanitarian notification uh, system uh, as part of the overall engagement to ensure there is the necessary dialogue uh, between us and and the two uh, the, between us and the, the Russian Federation uh, and 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 the Ukraine and this important interaction between civil and military actors in any uh, in any conflict zone. I mean, it's and it's critically it's critically important to ensure the safety of civilians and to ensure the, the protection of humanitarian workers and humanitarian um, uh, humanitarian uh, operations. Um, Martin said, you know, they, I think yesterday that they were looking for uh, contacts in the field uh, with Russian military leaders. I don't know if there's been progress in the last 12 hours on that. Um, this is a system that is being put in place as quickly as possible, but it is a critical part of our humanitarian architecture uh, in Ukraine. Abdelhamid. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, on Libya. Um, there was an initiative introduced by Ms. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie Williams, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know what happened to that initiative. However, I'm asking also in relation to that, the SG called Mr. Idbebe and called him Prime Minister. Is that the official position of the U and now the Prime Minister okay. is Mr. Abdel Hamid Idbebe? The UN is not in the business of recognizing governments. He had a conversation with him. 
the initiative that was announced, uh, we've been keeping you up to date. Uh, the invitations were sent out for a March 15th meeting. Today's been a crazy morning, but I don't think it is March 15th uh, yet. So Ms. Williams is doing exactly what she should be uh, doing, which is uh, talking to, uh, uh, to all the parties uh, and, um, and, and trying to move uh, this process forward to ensure that Libya doesn't slip back and that we don't lose the gains uh, that have been made for the benefit of, of, of the men and women and children of Libya. Uh, and my second question about Palestinian women. There are 32 Palestinian women in jail. Uh, since the occupation, 16,150 women had been uh, put in Israeli jail. They issued a statement, a strong one, calling for uh, Israeli to treat them with, uh, uh, according to international humanitarian law, they're asking for more uh, blankets, more uh, winter yeah. clothes, more uh, yeah. um, uh, other yeah. Yeah. special needs for women, and uh, they've been complaining mm -hmm. on that. So do you have any comment? Uh, I will check with our colleagues. Uh, we always believe everyone should be treated uh, according to international law, but let me check with our colleagues on that. Uh, Philippe, and then Carrie. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, coming back on this email, um, you propose to send us uh, this email, and I say yes for me, and probably yes yeah, for share everybody. Yes. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, we asked you uh, the MOU on Yemen and the tanker uh, safer. You send it also. Is it possible when you have a question in this room, and you send something later, not only to the people who asked, but to everybody, because yeah, it's we'll inter send it. we'll interesting for for everybody. Yeah, yeah, we'll send it to Thank share you. as widely as possible. Thanks, Steph. Um, a quick follow-up again on the story published by our colleagues from the Irish Times. You told us twice that it was not concerning a global email sent to the staff mm -hmm. globally. Could it have been sent by a division in particular? And if so, could it be concerning enough for the UN to launch an inquiry, especially at a time when one particular narrative can be seen as disinformation? Well, I mean, listen, I, the, the Irish Times put online a, and I think tweeted uh, an email, you know, from from someone in the UN. I didn't see the. There's no name to it. I don't doubt the veracity of that email, right? But what I'm saying is, it looks like someone, like in a regional office, may have taken upon themselves to send out an email as instructions. That is not. That was, should not have been done because there are no official instructions on what words saying those things. And, and the, the only proof that I can give you is that those words have been used, right? I mean, Rosemary DiCarlo used those words yesterday. As far as I can tell, she still has a job this morning. But it's always easier when it's top UN officials compared to the rest of well, the no, staff. I, 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 I disagree with you because I think when top UN officials, I, I'll, I'll speak just for me personally. When the secretary general says something, it's a signal to me that I can say the same thing, right? That's the way instructions flow in an organization. It flows from the top. So if the senior leadership of the UN are using those words, then those words can clearly be used. So, I mean, so do you know who sends this email regionally? It's, it's a, listen, I, I, you know, it, it's a regional office and it, it's an email that I, I what I'm saying, this email was posted. I don't doubt the veracity of this email. It is in no way official UN policy. All I can tell you is as the spokesperson here for the Secretary General, who I think represents the Secretariat, there, are no, there was no email sent out globally to staff saying, you can't say purple, you can't say blue, right? You can't use those words. Have you warned this particular yes, regional I mean, office? Yes. Can you share with us who it is? No, I'm not going to share with you who it is. It's just a, it's a, um, it is clearly something that should not have been sent. Thank you. Okay. Edward. Hi, Stefan. I have some other issues. Uh, on JCPOA, the Iranian uh, nuclear talk, because we know um, there, there are reports that it's imminent. It seems like everybody agreed to reach a deal very soon. So 
does the UN have any information about this? What, what, what's the evaluation? And plus, uh, the Russian foreign minister Lavrov demanded a written guarantee from the Western countries about um, uh, not hindering the, the Moscow from trading and cooperating with Tehran. Does the UN also share the worry that this might cast some doubts or shadow on the JCPO, the, the new Iranian nuclear deal? Thank you. You know, we are not a party to the JCPOA. Uh, it is clear, and we've said this since the beginning of the deal and also when the deal, uh, when uh, the U.S. pulled out of the deal, uh, that we strongly believe in the JCPOA. The Secretary General is following this very closely. He's being kept up to date. Um, we just hope very much that the parties will come to an agreement um, and... Uh, and revive revive this deal, which we believe is very critical. Um, sorry, uh, Maggie, please. Uh, uh, do you have? Oh, sorry, sorry, Edward. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just like there's too much stuff going on. Um, uh, Multitasking. Go ahead. Yes, exactly. No, no, no. I, actually, actually, you didn't you didn't answer my second part. Do, do you do you think do you think to put the now now uh, Ukrainian crisis to the JCPOA, the new Iranian nuclear talk would be a it, it, it would be relevant to each other. Look, I, I've seen a lot of the coverage uh, relaying the positions of different parties. Um, I think it is challenging enough to get all the people at the table to agree. I don't think they need, um, uh, they need comments from me to make things more complicated. Uh, our message is we encourage all the parties to come to an agreement. Uh, Margaret. Hi, Steph. Um, on the humanitarian corridors in Ukraine, uh, is there uh, any possibility that some of the Human Rights Office's monitors who are on the ground in Ukraine might be present at uh, some of these points to see what's going on since both sides are bl were blaming each other yesterday for violating yeah. the, the, the agreements? I will check with our Human Rights Office. I do not believe they're on the ground monitoring this, uh, this movement of people, but I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to check. Alan. Thank you, Stefan. I have a follow-up on the corridors issue. Um, the Russian Defense Ministry says that Ukraine opposing oppo is opposing the um, uh, people uh, living to the territory towards the territory of Russia through these corridors does the UN have any position on this I mean do you object the moving of people through these corridors towards Russia or not our position is simple people should be able to go where they want to go Oscar Yes, thank you, Stefan. Um, Stefan, my question today is regarding the situation in Haiti. So on efforts for reconstruction and recovery, in what priorities is the UN working in the country? And also the two countries in the island, Dominican Republic and Haiti, they share the island in two worlds apart in terms of development. In this regard, in, in migration, the Dominican Republic started the construction Okay. Sorry, Oscar, I'm losing. Uh, Oscar, I'm losing. Can you just repeat the question okay. on the Dominican Republic? The Dominican Republic has started the construction of a wall on the border with Haiti. Do you think the wall would have any implications in the region when Haiti is, the, is one of the poorest nations in the Americas? And the other one, the last question is uh, regarding the COVID 19 and why the COVID 19 vaccinations rates is still low in some countries, especially in the most vulnerable, like in Haiti, there has the 0.9% of people being vaccinated. Well, that's pretty simple. Uh, we've been decrying the inequity in uh, access to vaccines since vaccines were first rolled out, uh, that it's not, it's not the same in every country, and that the, the developed uh, world, the rich countries, frankly, have a moral obligation to support uh, those countries that cannot afford it uh, to get the vaccine. And that includes through COVAX or bilateral agreements. We are working in almost, you know, more than 160 countries uh, to support governments 
in getting access to COVAX, in helping with all the, the technology that comes and then the logistics that are necessary for the distribution of, uh, of vaccines. So uh, that's been our, our message. On the issue of the wall, uh, we have spoken out many times in many different places um, uh, saying that the building of walls is not the answer. Um, and I didn't get the first part of your question. Yes, I, I lost uh, the audio for some reason. I don't know, you got my questions and I don't know what did happen, but uh, you got mute and I don't know if I was mute as well, but uh, yes, I lost you. Okay, well, I, I will send you the tra transcript. I've answered the, your, two, two, your second and third question. Can you repeat your first question? Yeah, thank you. Yes, my first question, it was in the efforts for reconstruction and recovery for Haiti. So it was about on what uh, specific priorities is the UN working now in the country? Well, we're working through our, our office and through the UN system that's there on a vast uh, array of humanitarian and development programs. Um, the Deputy Secretary General was there <clears throat> uh, just a few weeks ago, um, and I would encourage you to read what we said at the time, but we are focused on helping um, uh, the, um, uh, the Haitian people in every way we can. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, uh, unless I see something else, I will escape and hand over to Paulina and wish her well.